here. I hope that you are going to feel God's love today. And I hope he sends you a ray of hope. And I hope it pierces whatever thing you've done around your life that keeps you unhappy today. We're going to have a wonderful service, and I'm so glad that you are here. Maybe you noticed today we started a new program. We put kids at the door. If you don't like kids, just turn around and leave. <laughs> this is a kid-friendly church. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I, I think that was a fantastic idea. I mean, <laughs> Say, when you see Mike Hill, make sure you tell him thank you. We had this wonderful concert last Sunday afternoon. It seems like so long ago. Wonderful concert, and I just want you to give thanks. He put a lot of effort into organizing that, and so we need to give him our thanks for his effort in that regard. Friday night, a bunch of us, like about 20 people in Fellowship Hall, or Apple Pie, Sherry Pie, Little Murray Pie, and Chocolate Chip. You would have hated really. It was awesome. <laughs> and we enjoyed the film called The Jesus Film. It was one with we had a really, really good time. The newsletter are in the mail. They're heading your way along with an updated church calendar for the month of May. There are always extra church calendars out in the North East in case you need an extra copy for whatever reason. Next Sunday, uh, we'll be passing out an information sheet associated with our collection and updating of information for the pictorial directory that we're going to be doing in June. And so we're trying to get everything updated. So look, be on the lookout next week for a sheet that helps us update the information we have about you. We've been on the process of creating an updated membership directory, and that's just part of the same, same process. So I just want you to be on the same team with that. I'm going to invite Lowell, oh, Lowell. How about Abel to come up to tell you about some things going on this week that I'm sure you're going to want to hear. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are we doing today? Good morning. I got a couple things to announce. This Monday, May 2nd, Food Pantry will be uh, opening the doors between 8 30 and 10 30, and then again at 5, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And then Friday, May 6th, the Young Adults Dinner Bible Study. Uh, we're doing the book of Matthew. Please come on. And then we have an uh, United Methodist Women's Spring Luncheon in the Fellowship Hall here this Saturday, May 7th at noon. All ladies are invited. Please come out. And then the men are having a state dinner at 6 p.m. that same day, May 7th. So all men come out. Please come and join us. Uh, Angela's on the grill, so. <laughs> well, thanks again. Have a great weekend. Let your light shine. Thank you. stand as we open our service today singing the doxology. recipients of his compassion and we are called to bring the same hope and the same love to others prepare us for service in his name amen, amen. you can remain standing you'll be fine <laughs> as we uh, we're going to 
actually seem, I seem to be having a, there we go. I don't know, it's like a technical thing with the buttons, yeah. Uh, we're going to, we're going to sing uh, uh, three songs, most of, Bind Us Together, Lord, we'll start with, uh, and then two others that I'll introduce uh, at the, at the time, but let, yeah, we'll stay standing uh, or bind us together, Lord, and then maybe sit down after that. Sí. 
person's favorite uh, favorite hymn. We are one in the Spirit. You know, I think a lot of you probably already know this. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are
service, uh, we invite our, our young folks to go for their uh, Sunday school, Bible school lesson for today, and we sing for them while they're leaving, so sing with me. Jesus loves a children, all the children of the world.
embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son who was dead but is alive. He was lost but now is found. Compassion. Are you compassionate? What triggers compassion in you? And what is compassion really? Scripture tells us that God has compassion for us. From Isaiah 49, verse 10, we read this. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice. You earth, burst into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on the afflicted. The story of the prodigal son has a multitude of lessons to examine, but I want to focus this morning on the simple return of the son and the actions of the father. Don't you wonder what were the emotions of the father through that whole story? Scripture strongly suggests that the father was overcome with joy when he sighted his young son and he ran to greet him, to hug him. And you can just imagine on his lips that the father would say, My son, my son, I am so glad. Welcome home. Welcome home. And with that, the Father sets in motion a huge celebration to rejoice. The scripture says, let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son who was lost and is now found. If you look at the human reactions that are possible through that story, there are many. I'm betting that some of you studied that story, you've read that story, you've been in a Bible study class with that story, you've been in a Sunday school class with that story, and so you may identify with different parts of that story. Some of you may identify with a young son. He just want to run away. More of you are likely to identify with the older son, who when he finds out about the party that his dad is beginning to practice, feel totally jilted, mad, and aggravated. And only a few of us can probably identify with the Father and the actions of the Father. And in that story, however, we see at least one possible definition of compassion. We're going to look at several this morning. One possible is the effusive offering of love given with no need of the recipient to do anything to receive it. Sounds somewhat like a definition of love, and they are very similar. <coughs> Compassion is part of who we are as Christians. It's part of what this father showed to his son when his son came back. And looking to next week, it is certainly what a mother would show in exactly the same way. The parable of the prodigal son is at the end of Luke 15. And just before Luke 15, there are two other parables. One is called parable of the lost sheep. And the other parable is the parable of the lost coin. The inclusion of the word lost in those two parables is completely intentional. And I think positioning them near the prodigal son 
with this emphasis on a lost son is also very intentional. In each parable, the lesson boils down to the father is rejoicing over the return of the son. And another piece of scripture in one of those other parables has something very similar in saying, I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The gospel is all about saving lost souls and celebrating when decisions are made to return home, to come back, to enter the kingdom once again. One. Just one. Let's look at the Bible and the stories of compassion. Let's look at the book, the book of Ruth. Some of you probably know the book of Ruth pretty well. It's a great story. I want to focus just on a sliver of that story. Ruth becomes involved with her mother-in-law, Naomi. They both lose their husbands. And Ruth, out of compassion for Naomi, chooses to make the journey that Naomi decided to go back to where Naomi had come from, which was the town of Bethlehem. Widows in those days were not treated very well. We have these two widows that decided to bond together for their future. You may or may not know that the term ruthless has a biblical background. The term ruthless, which literally means without Ruth, is based upon the compassion and caring of the figure of Ruth in the Bible. So the term ruthless is talking about the absence of a tender-hearted and caring person of Ruth. Good to remember. Months ago, we studied the book of Joseph. Actually, we studied the book of Genesis, and then there's the story of Joseph. And if you remember anything about that, you would have to agree that Joseph showed an inordinate amount of compassion to react to and to deal with his brothers and the family who came from their home where there was no food to Israel, where Joseph was in charge of all the food of the entire country of Egypt. Compassion. Joseph exhibited a bundle of compassion. The Bible is just full of stories of compassion. Perhaps the very best known version is the story that I'm going to skip today for time reasons, the story of the Good Samaritan. That story is full of compassion. But I want to look for a minute at Jesus and the scriptures that talk about Jesus. Psalm, 8, Psalm 60, sorry, 86, 15 says, But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That story, that verse, certainly speaks exactly to who Jesus was in his own life. And we see that played out in spades when we look at Jesus' interaction in the story of the death of Lazarus. In John 11, verses 33 through 35, we hear these words. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved, deeply moved in compassion. And his spirit, her spirit, and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid speaking to Lazarus? And they 
they said to him, Lord, come and see. At that moment, Jesus wept. Compassion oozed from every pore in Jesus' body. For the poor, for the sick, for men, for women, for those who had leprosy, Jesus had compassion for absolutely everyone. For to be like Jesus, therefore, requires on our part an extra measure of intent to also show compassion. Or do you apply compassion? I think showing compassion, to me, that doesn't dread the essence of what compassion should be all about. In Matthew 9, 36, we find the story of Jesus once more seeing a crowd of people. And the scripture says Jesus was moved with compassion. Moved, why? Because the people there were being harassed and they were helpless. And in Jesus' words, they were like sheep without a shepherd. There was a very well-known preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon, preached the last century after he preached in the 1800s. Well-known. And he had some compelling and penetrating comments on compassion that I want to share with you. In describing those five words, Jesus was moved with compassion. Spurgeon gave a sermon on those five words. And he said, this phrase is used about Jesus several times in the New Testament. The original word for compassion, he says, was a really remarkable one. It wasn't found in classic Greek. It wasn't found in the Septuagint, which was an intermediary version of the Bible. The fact is, it is a word coined by the evangelists themselves. They did not find in the whole Greek language a word that suited their purpose. Therefore, they have picked one. The word they chose is expressive of the deepest of our emotions. In highly descriptive language that you may smile about, Spurgeon said, compassion is like striving, a striving of the bowels. Bet you never heard that before. A yearning of the innermost nature with pity. I suppose that when our Savior looked upon certain sights, those who watched him closely perceived that his internal agitation was very great. His emotions were very deep. And then his face betrayed it all because his eyes gushed like fountains with tears. And you saw that his big heart was ready to burst with pity for the sorrow which his eyes were gazing. Jesus was moved with compassion. His whole nature was agitated as he commiserated with the suffering before him. Our Savior could hurt and cry and feel just as deeply as we do. Compassion for Jesus was a gut-wrenching trigger that forced him to
to respond, to do something, to do something, to do something. What is that trigger that makes you want to do something? What is the issue? The injustice, the calamity, the hurt, the problem, the issue that triggers you Pardon my English. Get off your butt and do something. Our response is pretty easy, really. We look at what happened when Jesus was interacting with the Pharisees and they ask him, all right, what's the greatest commandment? And his response was the one that you already know. Said in a variety of ways, love your neighbor as yourself. Because compassion is all about who God is. That is his innate character. And since we are made in the image of God, we too have got to embrace our participation in the need to have to show, to apply, to use compassion. Compassion like love is not just words. It is woven into our need to take action. It is not just about feeling, but activity directed to helping others or other living things like animals. Simple example, in my housing complex, I routinely see turtles, and some of them are big turtles, walking across the street. You ever seen a turtle walk? Trust me, it ain't fast. <laughs> and so routinely, I will stop my truck to block traffic, and where I can, I will often get out and help move the turtle to the other side of the street. Because if I don't, some very impolite driver, and that's the nicest I can say, will run over. You can say that about a lot of other things. Compassion then is a gut wrenching trigger to put us into action. In Ephesians 4:32, we hear these really cool words: "Be kind and compassionate to one another." What an idea. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. In a similar verse in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles. Hear this. So that we and comfort others. When they are troubled, we will then be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. That sounds a whole lot like do unto others. I want to tell you a story about a yellow river. Actually, based on a true story. Although I may elaborate a little bit. You see, there was a prisoner. I'm going to call him Fred. Because there's no Fred's out here. Yet. Fred had been sent to prison for manslaughter. He was driving drunk, killed someone. He suffered in prison for 30 years. Never had any eyeball contact with a single friend or member of his family. He wrote them letters saying he was sorry. He repented. Never got a response. Well, after 30 years, he got out. When you get out of prison after 30 years, you have essentially Absolutely nothing. That's a story for a different day. But he got on the boat.
bus. And he was headed back to the only place he knew where to go. <coughs> His home. He was nervous about this whole situation. Anxious. So he sent them a message that said this. If you want me to come back, I want you to tie a yellow ribbon around the tree in front of our house. As it turns out, his house was on the main street, so the bus would have gone right by his house. And the more he thought about it, he started to chicken out, although he'd already sent the message. So he befriended another young man on that bus. Confided in him enough to say, I want you to, to help me. By looking at this tree and tell me whether or not there's a yellow ribbon up there. So the bus moved along. They came into the town where the house was. They got to the near the house. They got near the tree. They're in front of the tree. The young man looks at the tree. about what he was going to say to Brett. And he said, wow, Fred, you can't believe it. There's ribbons everywhere. they got ribbons on every branch. They're on the ground. They're in the lawn. For the first time in 30 years, Fred felt So I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Who in your life needs to be given a yellow ribbon for you? <coughs> Who needs to know that you forgive them? Who needs to know that you have compassion for them and about them? Let God intervene in any relationship in your life that's broken. Friends, family, I personally know for a fact that some of you don't come from perfect families. That aren't. So maybe it's time to look at that. But now I want to move to Ukraine. Actually, we're going to move to Poland. I want to tell you a story that I learned this week. I was having a rough time working on the sermon this week. So God told me to go talk to somebody. I'm an old friend. I hadn't seen her for a couple of years. Her name was Lisa Hightower. I hope you'll see her one day soon. Lisa was telling me a story about her daughter, Lisha. Lisha's husband, Keith and their two grandkids. There is nothing special about this family, except the story I'm about to tell you. They go to a church that has a really interesting name that I really, really like. It's called the Compassion Christian Church. That's it. And it's in Savannah, Georgia. God called Keith, the husband, and Alicia, the wife, to go and help Ukrainian refugees. <coughs> and so off they go to Poland. Now, being a typical American, I, I didn't remember exactly where Poland is, so let, let me help you. Poland is in the north part of Europe. Germany's on one side, Belarus is on the other side, Hungary and Austria are beneath, Denmark and above. So they wind up going to the town of Warsaw to help Ukrainian refugees. And there are a lot of them. Some of them like the ones on the screen right now. You know, I assume there's a thing called a war going on. A 
So there are tons of people in the Ukraine trying to leave the country. And most of the ones that are leaving are the women who are taking their kids to go to a safe place <coughs> so they can continue to raise their families while the men stay there and fight. They go to Warsaw. Warsaw is about a 10 hour drive from Kiev that you've heard lots about in the discussion of war. But instead of listening to me, I want you to hear from them. These are the words from Keith's email within the last, well, probably about a month ago. They went, then they came back. This is from an email from Keith as they're flying back to America. As I sat on the plane heading back to my normal life in the United States, I struggled to find the words to share the life-changing experience me and my family had the honor to serve. You see, these past 13 days, while they were over in Warsaw, were not planned or thought out. As a matter of fact, some would say it was a reckless decision on our part. We did not overthink it. We didn't even discuss it with anybody except ourselves. We trusted in our faith and followed our hearts and made the choice to go into our savings and purchase four, whole family with four very expensive plane tickets to go and assist the Ukrainian refugees. We had no idea what to expect. No idea how we could help. No idea how to speak Ukrainian and very little Polish. You're a perfect fit. We did not know what our eyes would see or how our hearts would feel. Most of all, we kept preparing, but in no way did we ever forget. We were 100% sure that while we were going, this was because we loved Jesus. <coughs> it's really hard to describe, he says. It was like a movement inside us that filled every void and gave clarity and peace to our decision. I know it was the Holy Spirit. Lisha, the mother, said God was allowing us to be a part of his big plan. So buckle up and hang on. They said yes to going. Yes to trusting. Yes to serving. Yes to whatever would come their way. When they got there, one of the first things they got involved with were all the women and the kids. <coughs> and they actually created a preschool set of programs because of all the kids. They got donations to hire the people who came to work help with the kids through donations. How much in the way of donations? Well, it goes into some, some specifics, but the point I want to tell you is it was taking them $2,250. Let's say $2,500. To pay three people, three women, for one month. That's not a whole lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but they were trying to do something positive to impact these people who had been thrown out of their country, thrown out of their houses, thrown out of the rhythm of their, of their life, thrown out of their churches where they used to worship. We can help. Next Sunday, I'm going to ask that you guys consider making some contributions to go to this effort. 
talk more in the next day study. But one other thing that Keith and Leisha suggested that would be equally helpful is to write letters and put it in an envelope. And we'll collect them next week. Letters of hope. Letters of we're thinking about you. Letters of we care who you are. We have compassion in our heart. They need to hear that. Boy, do they need to hear that. Yeah, you can stick some money in the envelope. It's not just about money. It's not just about money. You know, as we uh, read scripture, we read, read the story at the end of Mark by a blind guy named Bartimaeus. Jesus is walking by Bartimaeus. Jesus, and Bartimaeus is on the street like he normally was. He's blind. He's out there begging. He hears that Jesus is coming back, so Bartimaeus stands up and shouts, Jesus, have mercy on me! And I hear those words. And I'm saying, aren't the people in the Ukraine shouting those out to us today? Aren't the women in this picture shouting out that to us today? Have mercy on us. That's why Keith and Leisha went, I think. I'm not even sure they've been out of the country before. They were not prepared. They were not trained. They felt God pulling them out of compassion to go and help. Some of you guys have perhaps been in situations where you needed to beg for mercy. You can empathize. I ask you to do that. In this. I hope you'll spend some time this week writing down a piece of paper. What is the truth? What is the truth over which, if you were put in a situation to do, you could not say no? You would have to say yes, like Keith and Leisha opted to say yes. Did it make any sense for them to go? Probably not. Not from a logic standpoint, but they went because they felt God calling them to go. Can you imagine yourself in this picture? By the way, this is a picture. I assume you might know or guess Ukrainians trying to board trains to get out of the country before bombing hits them. Not a very good picture from some perspective, but it's a picture that somebody took on their camera, their phone, whatever. I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to pull the trigger on saying, yes, I want to help an Ukrainian refugee family and come over here. They may only be here for a year or two, whatever it takes, but they don't want to stay here. They want to come back home. But they need a safe place to be. So let me ask you to think about whether you would be willing to consider doing that. There's nothing else to do it. We could have a small community of Ukrainians right here and make a real difference in their lives. Thank you This morning, as I close the sermon, the words have mercy. Have mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I just can't get those words out of my mind. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, we sponsor something called Open Communion. Anybody can participate. As long as you're in here trying to love God and come closer to God, we want you to participate in communion with us. I'm going to read through a liturgy. And in the middle of that liturgy, I want to invite you to consume your wafer. Lift up your hearts 
and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sins and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. You remember just a few weeks ago, Jesus was having the last supper with his disciples. And during that supper, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, telling them, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And after the meal, Jesus took the cup. <clears throat> and he told them, this is the blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin and the sins of me. Drink from this cup in remembrance of me. You may consume your cup. As we close our service today, please stand and sing with me, How Great Thou Art, O Lord my God.
gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus.